Hey guys, my name is John Keel, and I'm an assistant professor of both EM and sports medicine here at UF. And my lecture this morning is going to be on back pain for primary care. No disclosures. Initially, this was a lecture intended for 50 minutes, but I've trimmed it down a bit. So I've cut out some of the sections, and we're just going to talk about imaging, including red flags, common pathology, evidence-based discussion of how to manage their pain, and when to refer to pain management and you know surgical consultants. So just talking about radiology briefly, some of this is EM-based literature, but I think it applies broadly. So there's some pretty clear criteria, according to the American College of Radiology, about when to image lower back pain. And that's category B. And basically, serious concerns, red flags, or history of significant trauma. Those are the reasons to image somebody sort of acutely for acute back pain. Obviously, that doesn't apply to chronic back pain necessarily. But there are downsides to imaging. This is why you don't necessarily jump right to it, okay? More cost and radiation, more resource utilization, okay? Leads to more procedures, that's a big one, right? You find things, you feel like you gotta treat them. So generally speaking, if you don't have any red flags, the management strategy is gonna be six weeks of medical management without imaging. After six weeks, you have to think about what you do. X-ray is a screening tool. Uh, in a patient with red flags, you're probably gonna go with MR. And in somebody with trauma, you, you know, CT might be your imaging modality of choice. So some imaging pearls, just things to think about, okay, and why we don't necessarily jump to imaging. In asymptomatic patients over 60, a third had herniated disc, 20% had spinal stenosis, and 90% had disc disease, right? No, no back pain. This is what they found on their MRIs. If you get early imaging, it actually can lead to worse overall outcomes and identify minor irrelevant pathology on their MRI. Another interesting study, in the absence of red flags, found no difference between 3, 6, and 12 months comparing X-ray, MRI, and CT. And another one that I think is worth mentioning is that the presence of low back pain with radicular features, whether you want to call that sciatica or radicular back pain, is not an indication for early imaging. Jarvik in 2003 compared MR to standard X-rays and found really no difference in outcomes for primary care patients with low back pain. And ultimately, I think the MR patients ended up having more procedures and more costs associated with their care. And this is an interesting study uh, among primary care patients, surveying them for red flag questions with a setting of low back pain. And 80% had one red flag or more, and less than 1% had a serious back problem. So even red flags, as important as they are to consider, are not always going to lead you to a significant disease state. So what are the red flags? Those are worth mentioning. So neurological stuff, right? Saddle anesthesia, bowel or bladder dysfunction, you know, sexual dysfunction, B symptoms, okay? History of violent trauma, that one's usually pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, history of cancer or immunocompromised state. Lack of relief after six weeks, that would be considered a red flag, and that's why you start thinking about imaging. IV drug users. And then age isn't really a classically considered one, but I think it probably should be. And certainly a history of osteoporosis sets you up for spontaneous burst fractures. The so-called yellow flags are what will predict poor response to kind of first-line therapy. And this is not unique to back pain, but it's something you have to kind of think about as you prognosticate. So maladaptive beliefs, sleep and mood dysfunctions, job and social dysfunction, and uh, kinesiophobia would be a big one where they're, you know, reluctant to do PT because, quote, unquote, it hasn't worked for them before. That's always a red flag for me. So differential diagnosis, again, I took a pretty large lecture and trimmed it down a lot to fit it in this 20-minute window. So really just going to focus on your basic musculoskeletal disease, which is the vast, vast majority of what you'll see, and ignore the other stuff. And it's also worth mentioning that the differential diagnosis of back pain obviously does not mean only musculoskeletal disease. I'm not going to talk about this stuff, but just keep it in mind. So atraumatic back pain. So these sort of are just pictures meant to sort of stimulate uh, some thought on the disease process. So the first one here is just your basic lumbar strain, okay? This is a large chunk of your patient population with uh, acute or chronic back pain, certainly acute, um, where you may not find a specific injury or have a specific disease state in mind, but their back hurts and it sort of happened acutely, they were lifting something heavy or they woke up sore after um, whatever they do for work or hobby or they were snowboarding for the weekend, something like that. Pretty basic, nonspecific. Herniated nucleus pulposus or herniated disc, these can herniate in any direction, you know, posteriorly, anterolaterally, et cetera. And depending on the, the vector of that herniation, it'll determine their symptoms, whether they just have pain or 
whether there's any radicular features because it's compressing a nerve root, or in some cases, you know, it herniates posteriorly into the canal and can impinge the cord or the cauda equina, et cetera. Here's an MRI example of a pretty significant herniated disc uh, with some posterior um, herniation, and, and I don't know what this patient's symptoms are, but certainly an impressive herniation. So sort of the longer term version of this I usually think of is degenerative disc disease, right? This is a form of arthritis of the back, essentially, to, to put it bluntly. And um, as we saw in that MRI study, 90% of 60-year-olds who don't have back pain have degenerative disc disease, right, on MRI. So the clinical significance of this can be questioned um, as long as it's not causing ne neurological symptoms. Here's a CT scan of what I would call facet arthropathy. And you can see uh, here sort of laterally, right, this is an axial cut. You can see laterally the facets are kind of white and sclerosed and angry peering, and that's what facet arthropathy looks like on a CT. On x-ray, again, you're seeing it here, and there's severe facet arthropathy here between uh, L5, S1. Just you can't even see the facets at all. And you can see it to a lesser degree, L4, L5, L3, L4, et cetera. So I think that's a common cause of back pain that's underappreciated, right? And that's just arthritis of the articular facets between vertebral bodies. Another example of degenerative disc disease, you can see some scalloping here of the anterior component of where the disc is herniated out. And I, th I always think that this bone is just kind of growing over the disc. So that kind of gives you a silhouette of what the disc would look like on MR. You can see it again up here to a lesser degree. And again, you can see some pretty significant facet arthropathy and even some interspinous arthropathy as well. Spondylolisthesis, right, is basically when one vertebral body has moved anteriorly, typically, although it can be in other directions, uh, relative to the, the vertebral body below it, and you can grade that, right, based on how much motion there has been. You know, grade one is pretty common. I think you'll see that a lot. Uh, grade two, three, and four start to cause more symptoms, and you think more about cord compression and maybe associated fractures, et cetera. So, Spondylolisthesis, generally non-surgical initially. Spondylolysis, or pars inter articularis defect, is a different disease burden, but associated with spondylolisthesis. And that's where you have the pars here, fractures. This is usually subacute or chronic, as opposed to an acute disease state. Here's another one right here. And then here's sort of an illustration of what that might look like. So it points out what the pars is, and then it shows you how it can fracture, and then what happens when it fractures, and then the vertebral bodies kind of slide anteriorly. And here's another example of that. This is a pretty dramatic pars defect here without any anterior anesthesis of the vert. Spinal stenosis, another common disease, and, and that's really the way I think of that. It can be congenital, there's other causes, but for most folks, you know, I think the cause is probably degenerative disc disease as well as facet arthritis, et cetera, just narrowing the spinal canal as we age. It's quite common if you MRR people with back pain. In this one, you're going to think more about pain with extension or pain with flexion, pain going upstairs, things that put the, um, primarily put the back in extension. Here's another example of what spinal stenosis can look like on MRI. You can see, let's see, five, four, three. So the L3, four, disc space with some posterior disc and then some arthropathy on the other side. Uh, this is maybe not the best picture, but it kind of gives you a sense of what that can look like. So really, I think this lecture's goal is to give you some evidence-based approaches to management. And I have essentially two sections. One is pharmacotherapy, and the section is non-pharmacological non -pharmacological management. And so I'm going to go through those two sections. What I'm not really going to dive into is too much is like the different types of injections and surgical management. If, as a primary care guy myself, or a non-surgical guy myself, you know, I think if you need to have that conversation, it's probably better to let the, the spine interventionalist or the neurosurgeon have that conversation. So our job is to know when to send them, I think. So, so just sort of like basic management, right? This is your patient that presents to the clinic or calls in or whatever the case may be in the ED often, right? So you think about your sort of basic stuff, you know, NSAIDs and Tylenol and topical medicines, and there's a role for muscle relaxants. And that's sort of your second tier management depending on what you think is going on and comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we'll talk about each of these a little bit more individually. So a few evidence-based points here, which are real sticklers for me, and I, I try to practice what I preach here. So ibuprofen, 400 milligrams, max analgesic dose. There's really no reason to give anybody 600 or 800 milligrams of ibuprofen. There's a study in the 90s that proved that. There's another one here a couple of years ago. It's very crystal clear 
Um, for pain management uh, as a sole consideration, ibuprofen 400 milligrams, that's all you need. Acetaminophen, you know, the question is what's better, 1,000 or 650? This one may be not as clear literature. There's a couple studies that say 1,000 in post-op pain is better than 650, but I could show you a study that said 650 had the same number needed to treat as 1,000. So I don't know that the dust is quite settled there, but I typically give 1,000. Another study that I really like, and this was in the ED, but I, you know, I think it's relevant elsewhere, is if you give ibuprofen and Tylenol together for acute extremity pain, not back pain, but extremity pain, it's the same as giving somebody a Norco or a Percocet at two hours. And I tell patients that. I'm like, hey, you know, I, know, I know you're used to getting narcotics, but if you take these drugs together, they work better, and uh, they are just the same as taking a Norco. Okay. So muscle relaxants, you know, the jury's a little bit out. I don't think it's, the dust is totally settled. The Cochrane Review, review which again is from 2003, said they're effective for non-specific acute low back pain. So that's what I tend to use them for, but I think you have to consider your patient's comorbidities and any psychosocial issues they may have to decide whether it's right for them. And if you do give them muscle relaxants, you just have to kind of talk about when is appropriate to use it. NSAIDs, you know, they're definitely effective at short-term relief. Uh, they may not help with radiculopathy. The number needed to treat isn't that high, you know, for pain, disability, global improvement. Um, in the ED, and you know, you can't really extrapolate this one to primary care, but NSAID prescriptions actually reduce return rate to the ED within 12 months, which is kind of interesting. And again, take Tylenol with ibuprofen or whatever your NSAID of choice is. You know, the question of opiates is a little bit trickier. I realize primary care, you have these more longitudinal relationships and it's a little harder to say no to some of this stuff when you know how debilitating their pain is. So I can't really counsel you on your specific strategy for pain management. Other than that, the literature for at least acute back pain is, is not very good for opiates and the harms probably outweigh the benefits. Um, and I'm not a big fan of tramadol. It's kind of an interesting drug. I, I, I'd rather put somebody in narcotic. At least I can predict the pharmacokinetics there. Tramadol ha has addictive properties as variable pharmacokinetics, lowers the seizure threshold. People respond wildly different to tramadol, so I don't use that. All right, corticosteroids, I see this used once in a while. Literature is not good, um, even for radicular back pain. Sometimes, I will be honest, I will do it if they're not a diabetic and I feel like I don't have a lot of other good options, but the literature is not very compelling for corticosteroids. Gabapentinoids, again, not good for acute back pain. The question for chronic back pain is, is still out there, I think, but there's a lot of adverse events associated with gabapentinoids. There may be other reasons to sort of double dip uh, treatment, but as a, just for radicular back pain, I would say this is probably not a great choice. And then topical medicines, there's a lot of them, and you should certainly have a few of these arrows in your quiver. The literature is not that compelling. We use them, I certainly use them, but to point out some studies that say, hey, these are great drugs would be a little challenging. Couple more drugs, so duloxetine or Cymbalta, actually pretty good literature on this. I don't often start patients on this, but I will sometimes message the primary care physicians that sent them to me and say, hey, you might consider switching this patient from you know, Prozac or whatever SSRR they are on to duloxetine and kind of get the double dip. And there, I mean, it, it definitely, there's good literature for that. And then uh, Topamax is another one. Again, um, how, how effective is it? I'm not sure, I, I've never prescribed this, but uh, it's, on the, it's on the menu, so to speak. Okay. So let's talk about non-pharmacologic options. Essentially, I've got two components to each of these slides. One is acute back pain, and one is chronic back pain. And so for patient education, for acute back pain, a little bit of benefit, no risk, probably helpful. And that education can come from you, it can come from someone in your office, it can come from your physical therapist, okay? For chronic back pain, again, still helpful. And this is from a Global Spine Care Initiative with, written by a ton of physicians who kind of put this paper out. It's evidence-based, I think probably level, level four evidence for that. Heat, heat therapy. So this comes up a lot. Should I do heat, should I do cold? I think if there's, an, and I, this is sort of more broadly speaking, but if there's an acute injury with swelling, ice is probably the answer for the first 24 hours. After that, I think heat is most definitely the answer. And for back pain, it's not even a question. I don't have all the other slides in here because I don't have time, but Cold therapy doesn't appear to help with acute or chronic low back pain. However, for acute low back pain and for chronic low back pain, uh, there's you know level four evidence that this is helpful. So I strongly recommend this to patients. It's safe. You know, you just have to make sure they only do it 20 minutes at a time, not uh, overdo it and burn themselves. For physical therapy, 
I was actually a little surprised when I was making this lecture in the past. So level five evidence, right? This is a systematic review that it doesn't really help for acute back pain. Obviously for chronic back pain, that's a different story, but I've changed my practice a little bit, you know, in the first few weeks and you know, I don't think there's necessarily a role for it. When does it become chronic? It can be discussed, but I think by four to six weeks, they should be doing therapy. For chronic back pain, the literature is very clear, um, a lot of benefit, very little risk. And if you need a go-to PDF to print off, the AAOS, so American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Spine Rehab PDF, if you Google that, it'll pop right up and I give that to patients all the time. Okay, acupuncture seems to have benefit for both acute and low back pain. This systematic review only had two studies, but it showed benefit. But I think where the real value probably is, is for chronic back pain. And you can see they had nine studies here in this systematic review, which showed moderate benefits for pain and function. So that's level five evidence that acupuncture works for back pain. Okay, I don't think there's any question there anymore. So this is spinal manipulation. This could be massage therapy, could be a chiropractor. Spinal man manipulation sort of is defined differently in various studies, but for chronic back pain, it seems to have benefit. And I think relatively little risk. You probably have some chiropractors who might be deviate from the, the normal practice, but for most people, most of the time, there's certainly some value here. And you can prescribe spinal manipulation into your physical therapy too, as well. So yoga is awesome, I think, as a form of exercise. And for back pain, the literature is, is pretty clear. So in this one study, you know, it showed reductions in pain and improved function. And then in the more impressive studies here by Chu et al., you know, six randomized clinical trials showed small to moderate benefits in pain and function and highly recommended by the Global Spine Care Initiative. Tai Chi, kind of similar to yoga and the sort of slow isometric movements, emphasis on balance and core, uh, also has good literature saying that it helps. And so Tai Chi could probably be on the same list as yoga as far as what you suggest to your patients for both acute and chronic back pain. Cognitive behavioral therapy definitely has a role in how we manage back pain. It's a little tricky because you have to read your patient and, and make sure that you explain to them why you're sending them to a therapist for their back pain. And then you also have to be able to find a therapist, but there is certainly a role here and insurance will cover it. And the literature is pretty good, right? So moderate, moderate benefits in pain in this randomized, uh, five randomized controlled trials. So that's level five evidence there. And in acute back pain as well, it appears to help uh, with disability and quality of life. So there's definitely a role for that. Kinesiology tape, this is low hanging fruit which is why I included it, right? There's really no downside other than maybe a little minor dermatitis if you leave it on too long. And this is something your therapist can do and teach your patient how to do or have their family do it to them. But uh, good as an adjunct, probably with physical therapy, not as a monotherapy and, you know, pretty safe. The benefits in acute back pain are less clear, but certainly in chronic back pain, it's helpful. So I, I sometimes will put it as part of my physical therapy prescription. This is sort of mindfulness meditation, very much helpful for chronic back pain. And this is, again, the systematic review with three randomized controlled trials, small benefits of pain and function, but I mean, it's pretty harmless and probably has other non-back pain related benefits, right? So superior to placebo for anxiety, depression, quality of life, sleep, but th those things matter too, even though that may not be why you're seeing your patient. Okay, walking, right? This is just a woman standing on a trail, taking a break or getting ready, but Walking, super beneficial, right? Meta-analysis of RCTs on walking, as effective in reducing pain disability as other interventions. And I'm not sure exactly what that sentence means at the granular level, but to me, it means that you can say, hey, if you can get out and walk more, your back pain will get better. It doesn't cost you anything to walk around the block or around your neighborhood or get on a treadmill or go out for a nature walk, right? This is, I think, very low-hanging fruit for acute and chronic back pain. All right. Hydrotherapy definitely works. Uh, there's a few studies that I, I wanted to point out, which is one is that maybe it's not any better than land-based therapy. Not to say it doesn't work, but that it just, you know, land-based physical therapy is probably just as good. Um, and there seems to be a dose-dependent response. So the more days per week you go, the better it is, which kind of makes sense. It's just the challenge of getting in the pool for some folks is hard to do multiple days a week, but it clearly helps for acute and chronic back pain. So this should be one of the arrows in your quiver as well for how you manage your patients.
And of course, this is a online lecture. So if you have any questions, please shoot me an email. I'll be happy to respond to any of them at any time. Thanks a lot.